Bolly and tonic water calms the nerves. Joseph Sisko chills some tube grubs for Nog, and Captain Sisko forgot all about Nephi Beaumont as soon as Zoe Phillips moved into the neighborhood. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. We are also joined by a very special guest, Mr. Robert Hewitt Wolf, writer. And uh, it is a Nog episode, by the way. Melissa hey. Longo joins us. <laughs> uh, my name is Ryan T. Husk. Today we are doing a review of Deep Space Nine Season 4, Paradise Lost, directed by Reza Badiyi. Is it Reza? Reza. Okay. Written by Ira Stephen Bear and Mr. Robert Hewitt Wolf. This is going to be a great one. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Doing well. Doing really good. What an episode. Mm, 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 mm. So much to talk about. Um, yeah. Hey, Sirach, by the way, real quick, I have a surprise for you. Check this out. Which the detail in this episode is pretty amazing. I, I was I was watching this episode. It, it felt like a movie to me. Yeah, uh, it's just that good. There's so much to talk about and so much to cover. The performances, first of all, I thought were a one in this episode. Love the acting between um, Cisco and Admiral Lay- Layton. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. You know what I noticed too was that the the main the kind of the main characters in this besides Leighton and a little bit of uh, Ben Teen and Jarish Inyo, you know, but the kind of the the Deep Space Nine team was Cisco and Odo, Jake and Nog, and Joseph Cisco, and they carried the whole thing basically, you know, besides the the other a little bit characters. of stuff on the Defiant, yeah, yeah, unbelievable, just beautiful. Great stuff. So Robert. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, this is always really great to bring up because you are the son of a man who was in the military. So I always picture whenever there's kind of like these military things, I feel like a lot of this came from you throwing ideas out or they're asking, they say, what do they do in the military? And there was basically what amounts to be a false flag situation where they created this false flag. And I wanted to know if that was something where that came from, if that came from a, a historical event or just it was a good no, plot device. I think, mo- I think a lot of that was actually from Ron, Fair, mm-hmm. you know, uh, credit where credit is due. Uh, he has the story credit on it. And I think he might have thought of some of the, the mechanism for the false flag and how that was all going to work. Um, and I think that's where it all came from. I mean, the stuff I would run by my dad was more like, you know, just the the sort of ceremony, like how people would address each other, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, Starfleet plays by its own rules, too. So that wasn't, strictly speaking, like, you know, always in military traditions. But, but I, I feel like Ron came up with this story. I can't remember how it all came together, but I feel like Ron came up with the basic idea for the false flag and all that stuff. And then Ira and I kind of took it and ran with it and turned it into the two-parter, mm. which is why Ron has credit as for story on the second part. Correct. Yeah, I just checked. You're right. That's exactly yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that stuff, the mechanism and Red Squad and all that stuff, I think came from Ron. But it's been a while. <laughs> when in doubt, I'll give credit to someone else, though. You know? <laughs> why not? Um. <clears throat> You know, when you're writing for Cisco, um, he takes these very strong positions uh, on his belief system and the things that he's willing to fight essentially till death. Uh, you know, what, I just kind of want to know about the process of, of getting to that point with him and creating that, like, making that the pillar of his, his you know, uh, his stance. Well, I think, you know, I think we talked about this a little bit before where, Characters are really like a collaboration between the writers and the actors in, in so far as like, even if it's not a formal collaboration, even if it's just like we wrote this for him and did a great job with it and seemed to really respond to it. So we'll write some more things like that, you know, um, or we wrote this for him and it didn't play that well, you know, maybe we won't write those things for him anymore, <laughs> um, which was rare, obviously, but occasionally happened. But the, I think in the case of him being such a sort of like, fierce and committed to his 
to his values and, um, you know, like a, a sort of a charge ahead, get things done kind of guy. I think that that was definitely informed by Avery as we went along. You know, I think Michael's original idea for Cisco was a guy who was a little more hesitant and a little more unsure of himself in certain situations. And you can sort of see that in Emissary. But by season four, I think the character had grown. And I think we'd also sort of grown in matching that character to the th kind of things that Avery just hit out of the park all the time, you know? Um, and the, yeah. and the, he hit this one out of the park. Family stuff, you know, that, yeah. that strong leadership stuff. Um, the guy who can be like, an, uh, do it my way. This is how we're doing it kind of guy on the, uh, in ops and then invite everybody over for dinner. You know what I mean? That to us was, well, was a lot of who Cisco was. And so when he's, and that, th this episode shows both sides of that, right? When he's dealing with the security issues, he's one way. When he's dealing with his father and with his son. Right, yeah. And even, and even a little bit with Nog, he's another. Although with Nog, he tended to, to go back to that sort of commander, captain person. There was definitely a point where he puts Nog, he reminds Nog what the situation is. <laughs> he's like, let me, yeah. let me, wait, what, what does he say, Melissa? I don't know if you remember the scene where he says, uh, he says, I think you're under the mistaken impression that I was asking for a favor. <laughs> I want names and I, I want a name and I want it now. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I like that. I, I like that fine line that they have to walk between <laughs> being comfortable with each other and, you know, friendly, but you're also superior officer and cadet. So those lines can get blurred sometimes, but then it's like, oh, yeah. I, yeah, he's my, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's yeah, he, he, well, he may hang out with you at his dad's restaurant, but, but, you know, <laughs> when it's time yeah. for stuff to get done, you better do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the I, stuff I think came a little bit more from, from my dad was like, you know, I was not asking you a favor, you know, <laughs> I'm your dad. You are going to do this thing now, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And Cisco There's has a way. So I was just going to okay. say, and Avery has a way of like, when he gets into that level, his voice changes. You know, yeah. it goes from this to more of a boom, kind of. It's almost <laughs> like operatic, you know what I mean? Like it just changes. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, what were you saying, Saron? No, I, I'm agreeing with you. And I, I, he ended that statement that you made with understood, Mr. Nog. And I, and I like the idea of calling him Mr. Nog, which I just... You know, it's the way he said it. It just had so much texture in there. Um, but the scenes between them are great. And the other thing that Avery did in this episode, I thought really well, was play the psychological game with the with the Red Squad interrogation. Oh, um, that was brilliant great. scene. That was so. That was so Star Trek right there. Right, where he basically walks him into revealing everything that he was saying. And uh, I love the way you guys wrote that. I just felt like. It, it just it played so well and it, it was believable because he seemed to have known more than what he did right and that's how they kind of use these uh interrogations when the police are interrogating a criminal they they let them know that they know something right. but you got to tell me the rest right yeah yeah the guy in the other room already told me yeah. everything so yeah, you might as well just admit it yeah, exactly <laughs> it's a prisoner's dilemma right the first one to talk is the one who gets off easy yeah Nowadays, of course, you wouldn't have to interrogate him because he would have live live streamed the entire coup. <laughs> <laughs> In real time. Right? In real time. He, he would have like, Snapchatted the, just, him yeah, sabotaging yeah, the, snap the light. Yeah, Snapchat and see him sabotaging the power grid. <laughs> would have, the whole thing would be on parlor. <laughs> yeah, and speaking of that, I'm glad you brought that up because that is one of the things that I think uh, DS9 really stands the test of time on, and that is these themes that still resonate like i'm watching this episode and it feels like it was pulled out of the headline today in some way and it's i don't know how you guys do that so well it's it's kind of remarkable uh i know you say you don't have a magic ball and you don't have and you, don't, you know you're not looking into the future but it but keeps happening the, but it keeps it, it keeps freaking happening and well, we're looking here's the trick like we're not looking at the future we're looking at the past exactly and the sad right. thing is this crap just keeps coming back you know or we're looking at the present of the time. I mean, 
when was this 25 years ago so that was 96 96 january 8th 1996 was when this came out so you guys wrote it obviously in 95 yeah. yeah. you know we we were in the middle of the clinton administration so things weren't too messy uh we're not at that time of the administration but i mean there was plenty of like you know we were mm -hmm. looking more at the 50s you know we were looking at the sort of like right you know the 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 witch hunts the mccarthyism the the you know premature anti-fascism as they as they uh, called the people who were against hitler before world war ii you know that whole kind of like fear of spies and fifth columnists and stuff like that so we were just we were looking at history and and as i think i said in the last pod, uh, podcast i think it you know it, it felt very scarily relevant in like 2001, 2002, 2003, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, and now it feels relevant again. And and that's just, I think, the cyclical nature of history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, was there a particular person that Admiral Layton was based off? Because I, I noticed that... Ooh, good question. That's juicy. Hmm. Kind of... I, I don't think there really was anyone in particular... I think, you know, yeah, I can't think of anyone in particular that we based him off of. I mean, I think it was just sort of this idea of we wanted to make Leighton. Leighton's the hero of his own story, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Leighton is, a, it believes he's doing the right thing. And that I feel like always makes for the scariest villains in some ways, because you could almost see his point, you know, he kind of had a point of view. And that was really where we were coming from, was trying to create this guy who, uncompromising does what he thinks is best all the time and there's a danger in that right there's a danger that you go off the off the deep end if you're like that and that's part of what makes your writing so great in star trek as a whole is we never see a villain that's just one dimensional we never see a, very rarely see a villain where you can't you can't at least see where they're coming from, where you're like, okay, they're the bad guy, but at least I understand what their motivation is, you know? That was really important to us, mm -hmm. was, you know, to try to make sure that we understood where all the characters were coming from all the time. I mean, I, I think there are some definitely some characters who are like one-offs in one episode who don't seem to be particularly deep, you know, and maybe they have a scene or two, uh, and maybe they're just the villain for like an episode. Hmm. But I think most of the time, especially when we were going to go for these bigger, juicier roles, like a two-parter or someone who might recur, we, we definitely tried to dig into their psychology. And I know Melissa right now is thinking, what about Kai Wynn? She sucks all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you yeah. can see where she's coming from. Yeah, you, you know. She's, you know, she's always self-serving, but she thinks that she's, she uh, too is the hero of her own story. And she wants to be the hero of everyone's story, you know. So. Whether you like it or not. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think there was a line where um, Avery uh, Cisco said, uh, oh, yeah, and the answer is you. And I think it always comes down to with these kinds of people where they're the, they are the only answer to the, the problem, right? You need me. It's my ideas. I'm the solution. Um, whether it's Kai Wynn or, or this uh, Admiral Lee. Yeah. Look, right. there's, a, there's an instinct in human nature, the, the sort of um, the strongman instinct or the, you know, the, the white knight, you know, often a white dude uh, in our culture, but a guy who comes in and has all the answers and sort of like is going to fix things and, you know, drive things through and make everyone safe and make America great again or whatever the fucking line is, you know? And, and we have, a, I think, um, a predisposition to respond well to that. And that's a danger, you know? We want daddy to come and make everything, make everything okay. You know, I think there's a very primal instinct to that. And that can be really, really dangerous when it comes to leadership. And I think that that's kind of what Leighton embodies is that kind of, you know, big man savior in his own mind, but also mm. look in the minds of all the people who are following him. He wasn't doing this by himself, you know, that he had, he had co-conspirators people who thought, you know, he had the answers and, and, and stand the torpedoes and full speed ahead. And right. And that's why it was so important when they, they, when they realized 
hey, everybody that's a part of this has served with him before. So they were loyal to him. He knew he could trust them. He could say, hey, remember how I got you through that nebulous situation back in the day? And you trusted me. And now you have to trust me again. And they're like, you're right. <laughs> Julius Caesar, right? I mean, that's who he thinks he is, right? In a way, like the guy who's going to save Rome from itself um, and from its enemies. But in doing so, destroys everything that you know matters about Rome. You know, destroys the Republic to save it. Um, and that's kind of where he's coming from. Look, he, that's why he brings in Cisco, right? He thinks Cisco. He thinks he's going to win Cisco yep. over too, same as he won over Bettine, Bettine and all the other Bettine, people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And all the other people. You know, and it totally reminds me of another Star Trek episode in Next Generation. It has a similar dilemma, and everybody that's watching right now in the chat, in the live chat, what does that dilemma remind you of from the Next Generation? There's an episode where an officer has to choose between his or her loyalty to a superior or to a greater cause. Um, That episode to me that it reminded me of, I believe was called Pegasus. And it was Riker, uh, an admiral comes along that was uh, Riker's captain back in the day. And um, Riker remains loyal to him anyway. And Picard is kind of stuck in the middle to where Riker and the Admiral aren't telling Picard what's going on. And Riker has to choose, are you loyal to this previous Admiral and the chain of command, or are you going to stick with your gut or something like that? And I was kind of wondering, um, and it's a great episode. Uh, Robert, did you have much knowledge of the next generation or of original series when you got brought on to write Deep Space Nine? Was there kind of like a blueprint that you guys kind of followed or... I mean, certainly, you know, every one of us had seen every episode of the the original series many times, you know, I I was raised on it pretty much. Um, And then uh, Next Generation, you know, because I wrote that one episode for Next Generation, I I watched it eagerly when it first came on and then I sort of fell off. Which episode was it? I wrote Fistful of Datas, which was season five? I think so. It was my first job. So... So when I when I got invited to pitch, I I, I got back on the horse, and they were rerunning uh, Next Generation episodes at midnight on the local in local syndication. So I would stay up till midnight every night. And luckily, between when I got invited to pitch and when I went into pitch, I had like a month and a half. And then between the time when I sold the story and when I had to actually start working, I had a few more months because the way things fell out. So for like five six months, I just watched Next Generation every night before bed. And you know, it gotten way better than when I'd stop. I'd stop watching because I was in grad school and I didn't have time, you know, and, and, uh, and I was like, you know, doing my projects and my own scripts and I just had no time. And so when I went back to it, I was like, oh, wow, this has gotten so much better. You know, and I think I remember Pegasus being a good one. Um, there were just a bunch of them, like season three, even season two, Drumhead. I think it was like, maybe even, that might've been season one. But like, once I started watching again, I was like, oh yeah, there's a lot of good stuff. And then obviously, you know, Ron and Renee came over from Next Generation, and, and Ira did a year on Next Generation, and so did mm. Pete. Uh, so we always had people who who come off of Next Generation on the show. Michael, obviously. Um, I don't know if it was a template, but it was certainly like uh, sh- standing on the shoulders of giants type thing. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. we knew what had come before, and it was a strong foundation to sort of do our own thing on top of. Right. It's just really amazing how you guys were able to have part of it was was previous Star Trek voice that we recognize and we know and love, but also go in a completely different direction in tonality and theme. Uh, That's why to this day, I still think Deep Space Nine is the best written series. Thanks. I mean, look, there's a spectacular writing in all of the shows and Next Generation and the original series had some terrific writing and you know we always thought of ourselves in some ways as being like trying to be a spiritual successor more even to the original series than to next generation because next mm. generation sort of did its own thing and we we sort of tried to lean into some of the more sort of character struggling through real dilemma type stuff that was always part of next uh, original series and to the next generation too but it was a little more conflict than the original series, I think. 
might be fair to say between the various people in the show. And so we sort of leaned into that, I think. That was sort of our, our thought anyway. Well, uh, we're going to take a super quick break here, um, and then we're going to get way more into this episode. Really, really a good, great, fun, amazing episode. And uh, we will come right back on The Seventh Rule. Everybody, welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton, Melissa Longo, and Mr. Robert Hewitt Wolf. Uh, very quickly, here are the trivioids that may or may not have made it. We've got Red Squad is doing some sketchy stuff. Joseph Sisko chills some two grubs for Nog. We get a Bolian Admiral, because Bolians are one of my favorite aliens, so I get excited when I see them. Uh, Sisko reminds Nog who he is. Admiral Layton loves real coffee, not that fake replicated stuff. <laughs> O'Brien wants to sit here for a while, maybe go to a bar with Sisko, have a pint, throw some darts. Uh, Joseph Sisko reminds Captain Sisko about oh, nephew right. Beaumont. Now I forgot all about her as soon as Zoni Phillips moved into the neighborhood and bullying tonic water calms the nerves. <laughs> anyway, great stuff. Lots of fun stuff there. Yeah, um, you mentioned uh, O'Brien's performance. I thought he was really good in this as, as the different version of himself. He seemed more relaxed. He was, I don't know, he, he played it really well. I, I enjoyed the shape-shifting O'Brien. Yeah, it was a fun turn. I, I remember like us trying to decide who was going to do that part. Right. You know, who, who would we have there doing right. it? And we went around a couple of times and we finally just thought that Calm was the, sort of the most salt of the earth. He would be the least, it would be the biggest departure for him in some ways mm -hmm. to have him play a shapeshifter. And that's why we went with him. Yeah, he played that really well. I also like the line where he mentioned, there's only four of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's, that's one scary. of those lines that you remember. Like, I remember that 25 years later. That's, you know, every once in a while there's like a scene or an image or a line. That's one of them. Uh, that was really a good line. Really poignant. It's a great, yeah. it's a great moment. And, and like, just, he just delivers it so offhand. And also, like, I, I felt like, he was a departure from the other shapeshifters we'd seen too, you know, and mm -hmm. that he was just sort of this particular shapeshifter was a little more gleeful, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and a little more kind of like enjoying his work, you know, so, some pride yeah. of craftsmanship in the chaos he was sowing. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. Uh, the other thing that I thought was really great, um, Odo and Cisco got a lot of time together on screen and we got to really see them working together as a team uh, more so than we, I think we have up until this point. Um, seeing those two on screen together and, and delivering their performances, I thought was another uh, win for you guys. I mean, they're, they're terrific actors and their scenes together are always great. You know, I mean, yeah. again, I say this everything. I think I say this every time, but like, the biggest blessing a writer can have is knowing that when they write something that the actor's going to deliver. And that was something that was true for the entire cast. And so it was fun always to put together any two characters that you could think of from the show and put them together into a scene together was always fun. And a lot of times it was really fun to put together people who didn't have scenes together as often as they, they might, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. Worf and Garrick, you know, they don't have scenes together very often, but when they do, <laughs> good stuff, you know, or, or Mary Universe. Yeah. 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 I'll look, I mean, again, like you're right. Cisco and, and Odo don't, didn't interact a ton. I mean, I think he interacts the most with Jake, probably the second most with Kira. And I bet the third most is probably Dax, Dax. you know, and then probably yeah. Bashir, you know, and maybe then like, and then when you add Worf, like, so he probably, you know, interacts with Odo one, almost the least of anybody. And yeah. so it's great when you get them in scenes together because you're just like two, you know, it's like two heavyweights. <laughs> yeah. Going at each other a little bit, you know? It's great. Yeah. Yeah. So that My was... My favorite line, Odo saying, uh, everything I know I learned from the court. <laughs> 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 yeah. I love that you slipped that in there. You know, <laughs> that's a it's better rough. trivioid than any of the ones I picked. <laughs> well, it's, it's you know, 
It's true though, right? Like all the devious underhanded stuff he knows how to do, he probably did learn from watching Cork do all of it. Like right. while well, he was shapeshifted into a, a mouse or some stuff, yeah. like watching him from the shadows, like I'm gonna bust yeah. him for this one. Nah, you know. <laughs> yeah. get him in the next one. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. Right. Steel yeah. sharpens steel. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So uh speaking of good duos, we also had, of course, Jake and Nog together um a little less than in the the first episode of the two but it's just so great seeing them featured prominently in an episode that only features four or five of the characters you know usually they're you know they're there's the whole cast or the whole ensemble but this really was you know jake nog cisco odo and joseph uh, Melissa, did you have any uh, thoughts on the fun of Jake and Nog or Nog being the, the cadet bringing in whatever his name was, Shepard? Um, no, I, I really liked Nog's role in this in, in that he is the enthusiastic cadet wanting to move forward up in the ranks. And I love how naive he is still um if, you know not picking up on the fact that cisco is looking for a name for a reason and and not picking up on the fact that Admiral layton coming into cisco's cafe is not necessarily a good thing <laughs> you know it, He's still thinking, oh, th this is my way into Red Squad. This is my way into Red Squad. But um, not f picking up on the um, dangers that are necessarily around him. And um, and I think that it's a, a good stepping stone in his journey to see. Um, he's, he's grown up from the original rascally little dude to this guy who's maturing, but still trying to figure out his way. So I, I really like seeing that, that milestone in his journey. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I, I watched them back to back. This is the episode where Nog says, Jake calls Jake a writer, right? And so this is a relationship now that's grown. They're they're not kids anymore. These are two young yeah. men finding their way in the world. And I thought that that was that was a nice moment between the two of them, where it's like he's a cadet, Jake's now a writer. Like they're they're starting to become their adult selves, and and so it's a nice moment. It's just a nice exchange between them. So no, episode, actually, right? yeah, I wanted to yeah. ask you about that, Robert. Actually, was that this is kind of our first glimpse or one of our first glimpse into the direction of Nog's character. First, first, you know, 10 episodes back, he tells Captain Sisko, I wanted to go into Starfleet Academy. Then in Little Green Men, he's going to Earth. This is the next step where we're actually seeing him in Starfleet Academy as a cadet. And I was wondering if you guys had a discussion at all about how are we going to take this character or did it just kind of evolve organically i think it evolved organically i mean once the big discussion was will he join that he should join starfleet mm -hmm. you know that was the big thing and once once we got to that point you know we sort of thought he, it would be fun to just both let him get really into that you know but also find out hit some bumps along the road and and so that his wide-eyed enthusiasm, you know, you could batter that up a little bit <laughs> as he grows and matures. Um, but I, I don't think there was like major discussion until it was time to break an episode and figure out where he was. And then it was like, oh, well, mm -hmm. where's Nog now? Like, okay, he's on Earth. We should definitely use him. Let's figure out a way to like make him part of the big overall story, like, and get him into the get him into the middle of the action a little bit. Um, so that's sort of where we were at. You know, I don't think like right now we weren't thinking about him getting his leg blown off and going to PTSD. <laughs> we didn't have, you know, that wasn't in our minds yet. Um, although we did knew, know we wanted to, we wanted to have the enthusiasm of like a new American who joins the army. You know what I mean? Or, or like an immigrant kid who, who just wants to like 
who just loves his new country so much and wants to be part of it and is just like super excited about it. And mm -hmm. then to let the realities and the shades of gray sort of sink in over time. Don't say shades of gray. That's like the worst <laughs> PNG episode ever. That's the one that gives me nightmares. <laughs> well, in their defense, <laughs> that was the writer's strike that, that derailed them. I know, so. I know. <laughs> So I want to ask you because last time we talked, you mentioned Robert that this was going to be the first, uh, the the opening of the season four. So this was a two parter that was going to really you know bust season four wide open. Yeah. And now now we're seeing it in the middle, and I can see why it would be a season opener because it's that well written and that well thought out. Um, a lot of intertwining stories that kind of make sense as it goes on, right? Red Squad being one of them. Um, what you know? What Defiant was doing with the the um, Lakita, Lakota, Lakota. Lakota. Yeah. Lakota, yeah. So, but my question for you is basically: so when you push an episode, when you push this episode back to the halfway point of the season, uh, what do you do? Like, how how are you um, pushing? Are you pushing everything back now? So, season five, season opener would have been the halfway point mm. of this season. Do you know what I mean? No, no, because look, we did 26 episodes a year, so you could move things back and not really, you'd still have, we still had 16 episodes to tell the same amount of story. You know, it's not like, and, and, and a lot of the episodes are standalone or, you know, have very, have a little tiny touch of continuity. So the big thing was once we brought Worf in, we wanted to spend some time with Worf and the Klingons, you know, mm -hmm. so that we had way the warrior and then like six episodes to sort of absorb warp into the family and tell the story of the Klingons and the Cardassians and all that kind of stuff. And so that was really the, the, the we carved out room for that. But I think the, the big beats over the story would have, would, we would have told over the course of season four didn't change that much. Um, and and it was an organic process to make story in the in the show anyway. So we weren't like always we didn't always know what the end of the season was going to be when we started writing it. You know, we you know the the panster versus plotter thing. You know, we were sort of in the middle somewhere. Where we were like sometimes we we're flying by the seat of our pants and sometimes we we're plotting far ahead. And you know, but generally we tried to figure out what the end of the season was going to be, like four or five episodes before we were writing it. You know. Um, but honestly, sometimes we were writing it and figuring it out as we were writing the finale. Wow. I mean, we just, again, like five writers, 26 episodes, we were running as fast as we could. Yeah. We were talking about before we started recording about the difficulties of 26 episodes per year just sounds unbelievably difficult. But as you and Sirach are saying, there was also a little bit more flexibility there where you can kind of just move an episode over. And, 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 and it's true that. I, I, I too can see why this would be a great season opener because it basically changes the tone and the tenor of the entire show's story is now suddenly it's a more dire situation. Yeah. But we also tend to do that in the middle of the season too. Like the McKee one and two are a mid season two parter, mm -hmm. you know? So we did the Dias cast. Like a lot of those are mid season, you know, uh, in Bruno's light purgatory shed. A lot of the times we would do those big mid season two parters, and so when we realized we weren't going to do the season opener with this one and we were going to do Way of the Warrior, we, that was our intention. was like, we'll move this. It'll be the big season, mid-season two-parter that we've started to do more of. Um, and that will be, yeah, it was like McKee was season two that we did started that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, th th that was the logic. It was like, okay, it'll be our big mid-season mid one. Um, but look, I mean, the, the places where it shows are the action sequences you don't see. Because there's a lot of action sequences that are implied in that show that you do not see. Like, you do not see Red Squad yeah. taking over that right. power plant. You do not see how Cisco got into Layton's office, right? You barely see the battle with the Defiant and Lakota. I mean, you see it, but it's not like... Right. It's just one ship against one ship. When, the, when there are people in the streets, you see a dozen Starfleet officers. There's no big, like, set action piece for Avery, you know? Uh, had it been the season opener, like imagine some of the big fight sequences from Way of the Warrior, like Cisco trying to get into the sort of run and jump of Cisco trying to get into Layton's office. We just blew past all of that, you know. Um, well, honestly, good 
good. Yeah, there was, there, was, some. <laughs> there was so much story in this that if you spent yeah. all this time on the, the squabbles and the fight, just have Odo do the Vulcan neck pinch. We get it because there's so much story in this episodes that that, you know, that other stuff would have been kind of just filler. But when we don't need filler, there was just too much going on. Yeah. And look, we might not have had as much time for Joseph Sisko, right? And that would have been a tragedy. What a highlight. So it all worked out. It all worked out. You know, where did you guys shoot uh, Joseph Sisko's restaurant, by the way? That was, uh, was on, on stage. On stage, yeah. Really? Was that 17? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, 17, I believe. Yeah. So it was like we had two two stages that had the major standing sets. Stage, I can't remember the numbers anymore. Four. Four. Four, four was ops and all the stuff. Right, it was ops and the quarters and the docking ring and the habitat ring were all on four, and then was it five or what was the next one over? It was four, seventeen, and eighteen. Seventeen, so seven, yeah. So then seventeen was the promenade, and it took mm-hmm. up the entire stage. So wow. eighteen would have been 18. where we we built uh, Joseph Cisco's, and we would have built it like basically right next to the cave sets because in the back of the stages there were all these cave sets. So we, yeah. a lot of time we would just build stuff like in front of those. Um, so that's what it was. Stage 18. Man, I was picturing like New Orleans Square at Disneyland. Like I was there, dude. I was totally there. <laughs> I mean, they did a great job on those sets, man. Uh, we had a great crew and they would build some, be- they built beautiful sets. I mean, to me now, like, especially seeing it like up a little bit, not, not up seeing it in 720 on a 4k TV, you know, it looks a little like, oh, okay. It looks a little setty. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't think most people would have noticed. You know, you know, one thing I think that Joseph Cisco adds to this uh, storyline is the perspective from the common person, right? Then, the viewer. Non-star- right, the viewer. Like this is this is how it would affect us in our daily lives, as opposed to uh, how it affects Starfleet personnel or, or whatnot. Yeah, that was the intention for sure. You know. Yeah, he was. I mean, was Nog, you know, Nog shows the perspective of like a low-ranking Starfleet person who's trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Like Leighton's betting they're all going to come along with him, right? And Joseph. Represents the civilian point of view again. Leighton thinks everyone will be on board, you know. And in the end, neither of them are, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, and you brought the... up another. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry. You no, brought no. up the the thing that you brought was the 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 the, the uh, battle between Leighton and the president when Cisco came in and said, "Hey, we, you know, this is what's going on. You've been duped." You signed the orders, but he's taken the orders farther. He's issued Red Squad to do this thing and whatnot. Um, I like the argument that you posed, which was, well, now that we've imposed this kind of a thing, I can't take it away from the people because they they want it. They're calling for it. They, you know. And I thought that was an, an interesting point that you just brought up for for contemplation. Yeah. Again, like the strongman, the strongman complex works because people especially people who are scared tend to embrace Mm -hmm. it, you know? And that was sort of what we were trying to say. And like, how much could the president really steer things if people were terrified and there'd just been this blackout and people died and, and, you know, there'd been a bombing and, you know, it's the old security versus freedom thing. It's the, it's the Benjamin Franklin thing all over again. Right. Right. That tug you can of have war absolute forever. freedom, or you can have absolute security, but you can't have both. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think Cisco said it said it really great when he said, "Paradise has never seemed so well armed." Yeah, that's the line. Yeah, yeah. If it's got guns everywhere. Is it paradise anymore? If there's a if there's a Starfleet officer with a phaser rifle in every street corner. Mm-hmm. It doesn't look like paradise, does it? You know? That's touched upon later on too with Riza, if I remember correctly. But we'll cover that when we. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're still. I will be here for that. That's yeah. that, that, oh, that fine episode. That's another thing, Robert. I was thinking <laughs> I'll about show up that. Show for the ones I feel good about. I was I thinking show up about for the ones that. that I really think didn't go well. We've only got a, a season and a half with you left, man. This is 
I was thinking about that. I was already getting sad about it. Uh, but well, let's I, have you look, back I, on an episode I only you don't worked, like. Yeah, I only worked on yeah, I only worked on one through five. Well, I, I'll come back for Field of Fire. I did that in season seven. All right. Um, but yeah, I, I, I should come on here and talk about an episode that didn't go so well sometimes. So I don't just show up when <laughs> yeah. up, just show, just for the parties. Sometimes I got to show up for the funerals too, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why did you do that? That sucked. This was terrible. Why did you pick that? <laughs> I feel some of the fire. There are good reasons for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really like this. It's funny too. Another just random coincidence is that I believe that they were talking about the president's speech on January 14th, which today is January 14th. So I just like you literally predicted it to the day. <laughs> I know these guys and their crystal balls, man. <laughs> It was just the day it was going to air, you know. We weren't like again, yeah, like okay. we're not like we're not like trying to like look forward in time to like oh, there's going to be a presidential inauguration and things are going to get all crazy. And who was the DC psychic or... out of your out of your group? Come on, <laughs> who was? was? No, no, yeah. no. That's the air date. Like a lot. If there's a date, if we mention a date on the show, right? Okay, and actually yeah. mention a date. It's usually the air date. But if we mention okay. a time of year or a date on the show, it's usually right around the air date. So, like, the Bell Riots took place in May because that's when the episodes aired. Like, there wasn't okay. any, like, there was, that was don't so ruin good. this for us, Robert. <laughs> don't take this away from us. <laughs> no, I, look, here, let me just pull aside the curtain and you can see all the... <laughs> I was like, January 14th? Really? Really? <laughs> well, if we'd really been psychic, we would have made it the 6th, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. right, right. Um, no, but that's the day. That's the day we're recording. So I just thought it was just crazy. I'm, I'm watching this. <laughs> Another thing I, I noticed was out of the names of the defectors that um, that Cisco was looking at, one of them was Snowden. And I said, "Hey, that's an interesting last name. I've heard that." <laughs> I name know. Before. I caught that one too. Did you catch that? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, speaking yeah. of catch, it's a catch twenty two reference. It's not a reference to. <laughs> it's not a reference okay. to Edward Snowden. It's a reference to the character from Catch twenty two. So is Or. There's an Or and a Snowden in there. In the list, oh, it wasn't the hockey player oh, Bobby Orr. No, 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 oh. no. It's Orr and Snowden from Catch Twenty Two. They're, they're two. They're. Uh, I think Orr was. Orr was Yossarian's tent mate. I think he was a pilot, and I feel like Snowden was the bombardier who gets plunged <laughs> on the crap. Um, I love it. I insert these things that nobody would ever know unless you said it. Well, they're just you know, little in jokes for the for the for the for the people who are paying attention. Before yeah. the internet, like they would just go by and no one would pay any attention to like the fact that you name a couple characters from from uh, from Catch Twenty Two, and there's a couple characters. There's the Lakota and and uh, and Benteen, and Benteen was like was like one of the one of the people who fought at uh, Little Bighorn, and the Lakota obviously were the other yeah. side. Yeah. So like, oh, there's wow. little jokes like that. Like um, in uh, Past Tense One and Two, a lot of the characters are named after either actors or characters from from uh, The Magnificent Seven for no particular reason. It's just like what we did. So <laughs> well, yeah, because every week you have named... to come up with names. Every week, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we have to come up with some names. So like the billionaire is named Chris Brenner. That's Yule Brenner who played a character named Chris. And, and uh so yeah there's not like any deeper meaning necessarily like it's just whatever goofball references we decide to throw into the episode yeah but nobody's gonna know that you're using the air date as the date you know or or you're picking stuff from characters from catch 22 i mean i i love these insights because it just it just gives us a little insight on how you pulling stuff from different places well the air date like like uh people would i think have resonance with it because they would be like oh that's today or tomorrow or that was yesterday like you know what yeah. i mean like i'm watching right. the show live no one's no one's streaming cool. anything 25 years ago and so when we say january 14th there's a pretty good chance you're watching it on january 14th so it feels like now it feels like it's happening in current time you know and that right. that was the reason we did that the goofball naming is just the goofball naming we're just like whatever <laughs> playing around and throwing in references uh the, the i feel like the girls that cisco falls for mm -hmm. yeah, oh, Nephi, yeah. i have no idea where Neffy came from yeah but beaumont was a perfect name for new orleans yeah it's kind of and, a french and name zoe was my friend's girlfriend in high school uh, <laughs> 
if you're watching this, Zoe, I hope you're doing well. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sure she's watching. Uh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, so we would just do stuff like that all the time. Just throw in little things that were like to amuse ourselves. I would do throw in references to like obscure, like video, not video games, like board games and stuff like that too. There was a lot of that. Mm. Um, again, like, we were just trying to come up with a name, like on the spot. It's like, what do we want to name this character? Well, let's just name everyone after Catch Twenty Two. All right, that's easy. Just keep going. <laughs> so we only have a few minutes left. Sorry, Srock, you look like you're going to ask something. Oh yeah, but I, I, I was going to just talk about the chain of command and how, how, how much emphasis was spent on just the chain of command. I, I just imagine that, um, Robert, that was kind of coming from your your side of the. Uh, uh, experience. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that probably was a little bit more for me. I mean, chain of command was something that was kind of like drilled into me a little bit when I was a kid. You know how things worked. Um, and yeah, look, like Layton is in a position. He's a three-star admiral. Like he's in a position where he can pull this stuff off. You know, and Cisco is a, a newly minted captain. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. and so it takes a lot. It's a lot harder for him to stand up to an admiral. You know, especially mm -hmm. one that used to be his mentor. That's what we were trying to create was a power dynamic between them. And then you see it between Cisco and Nog, you know, who is a cadet. So he's like, Many I, wa I want to say that he's as far below Cisco as Cisco is below Leighton, but that's not true. Like Cisco's a little closer to Leighton uh, yeah. in the, in the, in the yeah, Leighton had six pips. No, he had three pips. Three on each side. Yeah, but that's that's the same. There, he's three it? pips. It's well, three Cisco's star. got four, so I thought it was six altogether. No, uh, so Cisco's got four. They're all filled in, right? So he's a full captain. And mm -hmm. then when it when you become an admiral, there's a different. The bar looks a little different, right. and the pips look a little yeah. different. And those are admirals' pips, and they're like the next. Like then there's like theoretically five up to five five uh, pips of those. So it's just like the stars, you know. Got it. On a general's uniform. Makes sense. Yeah, Pippin pip, pip ain't easy. Pip ain't all right, here we go. Here oh, we go. So oh, well. There it is. That's well all played. I got. Well played. No, that's not all you got. I remember you made another one about Pips a while back. <laughs> yeah, I, can't, uh, I can't recall it. I can't recall it. Yeah. Um, so we do have a uh, one minute left. There was the, the ending. I did want to bring that up really quickly because it – these are the kind of things that I, I notice now when I was watching as a kid, I would notice like the aliens and the overall themes and the spaceship battles. But now I notice this and it was just nice to see Joseph Cisco just welcoming every, everybody back in. And Robert, you talked about last week, how you wanted that. He's a community man. You, you said, uh, I can't remember whose father, I think it was Ira's father was kind of a community man. Yeah. And it, it really showed us that he comes in and he always has this thing that he says, I recommend this today. It's got a little bit of a kick, but it'll make you smile. And it, that kind of stuff, like that's a highlight for me nowadays. We, we wanted to show, it was a way to show the win too, right? Mm -hmm. if Joseph Cisco can welcome back in his customers and there's not armed guards on the street, then, mm -hmm. then Cisco won, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if we can have an inauguration... <laughs> <laughs> you know, of some form, then then the democracy is going right, and hopefully, they'll you know, DC will eventually be devoid of troops. You know, having twenty thousand soldiers in the capital <laughs> is it's not yeah. a good thing, man. It's just not good. I mean, it may be yeah. necessary, but it's not good. We want that to go away. But look, like when the riots stopped, riots, protests, some looting, some rioting. When that stopped in LA and businesses opened up again, it felt like very hopeful. Yeah. Um, and then they closed again. <laughs> then, yeah, they I, again. I, then they closed again. <laughs> but, but to add, but just, to, just to show how real what you guys wrote is, uh, restaurants are a barometer for how yeah. society is functioning, right? Because we, we are experiencing them now with, with restaurants having limitations or being closed altogether. All but uh, they definitely give you a sense of how the community <laughs> is getting together, how people feel. I, I thought spoken I spoken like a true restaurant tour and a and a community yes. man. Yeah, yeah, something that I've experienced. Uh, but Ryan, I thought you were going to say about the ending 
Um, the thing that was left as a question to me was when Admiral Lathan was walking away and, you know, finally had been defeated, um, Cisco, he says to Cisco, like, I hope you made the right choice. And okay. Cisco gives a look to the camera where he's not quite sure if he made the right choice, right? And I like the way you end episodes like that, where it's not so black and white. Yes, you, you're right. It's more up in the air, might be right. Yeah, when he said, I hope you made the right choice, you're right. Cisco gave a look that said, so do I. Yes. And he, we may have written him to say, so do I, and, and we may Seen have then way. cut it uh, <laughs> because we didn't need to because Avery just freaking delivered the line without saying the words. Or he may have even said the words and we cut them. I can't remember, honestly. Mm -hmm. But that happens sometimes, though, where you just like you write a line and the actor says it and then he but plays it as well. And you're like, well, it plays without the line. Let's just cut the line. And mm -hmm. Avery was I mean, Avery is a terrific actor. And so that, that happened a lot, <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's better. Like if you can if you can if you can do it without that, it's just like the audience has to like work a little harder, but in a good way. Yeah. You know, right. like what's going on with him? How would I feel in that situation? You know, what would I say in response? Uh, or what's coming next? Like, what's that's what I felt too. I'm like, well, what's the next episode? Like, is it the next episode? Are they gonna, <laughs> is, it, is it gonna get worse or is it gonna get better? So, I, I think you leave us all kind of wanting more with those uh open ended endings. Hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, it, it's I, I, I it sometimes it's nice to end an episode on an answer, but a lot of times it's nice to end an episode on a question, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, which maybe we answer in the next episode or maybe we never answer. And, and it's still up to the audience to decide. Let's do the same. Will we be right back? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, we do have to run. Uh, Robert, thank you so much, as always, for joining us and really giving thank us you, these you. insights that have been burning questions for like 25 years. It's really cool. And we really appreciate you. Fun to be here. It's always fun to talk about the show. I, I, I love it. And I love seeing you guys. So it's all good. Thank you so much. You're right on scale. January 14th, right on the day. <laughs> He's never going to let that down. He's going to see you in 20 years and be like, remember that time? <laughs> so.